Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Rich Reyes Gawan. The um, past two months, as of, I think, yesterday, the director of the DC Public Library. So a lot of my experience is actually um, in New York, and I'll refer to that a little bit. And I'll try to not be duplicative. We didn't compare notes, so there were some thoughts that are, 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 are a bit repetitive. Um, so the press release for the event suggests that the second wave of the digital divide, a divide centered more around digital skills than it is around digital access, is an emerging trend. Uh, but the truth is that, that researchers have been documenting this trend for the better part of a decade. Um, over six years ago, uh, Tufts University released a report that said while digital divide might be narrowing in terms of access to the internet, a significant digital skills divide is emerging. Um, the study centered around 120 parents from different socioeconomic backgrounds and how well they could search for, retrieve, and evaluate child-rearing information online. And not surprisingly, researchers found, uh, I'm sorry? Okay. Are you heckling me? No. Um, so not surprisingly, researchers found a strong corollary between socioeconomic status and online research skills. Uh, some examples, uh, uh, folks from the lower sec uh, socioeconomic status uh, wouldn't change their browser depending on what they were looking for. So a lot of them were using like AOL as opposed to moving over to Google or something like that. Um, also, they were more easily satisfied with anything that they would pull up. So they would, you know, find information from a discussion group and they would cite that as, as a reliable source as opposed to something that might be coming from a, a more authoritative source. So if the research around a digital skills divide has been around for years, why is there a renewed focus? Why are we all, all sitting here in this room this morning? And I think that, that uh, I'd argue that it's back on our radar uh, because of this problem that maybe somebody else calls it, but I like to call it digital exclusivity. Um, so the world has lost its patience, I think, with those who cannot navigate the online world. Um, and, and because those folks who cannot navigate the online world are typically uneducated, poor, or otherwise vulnerable, to many this group is really easy to overlook. Um, so, you know, we've, we've quickly moved away from this labor-intensive uh, but still necessary process of providing information and services in multiple formats. Um, six years ago, uh, if, if you couldn't submit a resume online, you could probably figure out a way to submit that resume in, in, in its print form. And, you know, my last employer, Brooklyn Public Library, we did away with that. You know, it's, it's, you know, we couldn't afford to keep a receptionist in a certain area, so now it has to be done online. And it's not, so there's nothing evil or there's not a conspiracy around this. This is just, it's just so much easier for people to, to work in this exclusive online environment. Um, you know, six years ago, and, and the, the examples are myriad. You know, you could take a GED example, uh, a GED test, a pencil and paper. You can't do that now. Um, applying for health insurance, obtaining physical tax forms. Um, increasingly, it's difficult to just run your life without, without um, um, access and skills. So... Um, and you know, from my own uh, from my own personal life, I was the president of my co-op board in Brooklyn, and uh, it was very easy for me to set up a website where I could put all sorts of information on that website about when we're going to do, uh, you know, we're going to replace the elevator on such and such a date. We're going to do these things, and I didn't have the time to go around and talk to people who weren't online. So there's, you know, you could see it in every everyday life. There were there was an, uh, you, you could see how that skills divide manifests itself. So six years ago, I cited um, this Tufts University study in a grant application that I made to the Leon Levy Foundation. I wanted their help in addressing the skills divide at my new job at Brooklyn Public Library. I had just been hired as their central library director, and when I got there, I was really appalled at this phenomenal landmark building, which gets over one million visitors per year. It had basically no dedicated training facilities. So um, I'm oversimplifying here, but I asked the foundation if they would be interested in funding a dedicated training and collaborative learning space. And I'll get to that happy ending to that story in a moment. But uh, the point that I want to make is that one of the major challenges that public libraries experience in helping to improve digital skills is one of space. Um, and I've, I've said this a million times, uh, you know, the vast majority of public libraries, facilities are really built for transactions, not for transformation. You know, they're built for circulating books and getting people in and out the way you would in a supermarket. But what we need to do is design our libraries in a way to, to, to you know, increase educational opportunities, to, to focus on human capital development. That's what we want to be experts in, and that's what we are experts in, but in many cases, in spite of uh, the facilities in which we work. So it's a, it's a really, really uh, huge issue that uh, I think deserves more more conversation. Um, public library staff, they're experts at, at providing information and services to vulnerable populations. We spent too many years really jerry-rigging jerry ill-suited spaces in a futile effort to, to create environment hospitable to learning. 
So in January of 2013, with the help of three and a quarter million dollars from the Leon Levy Foundation, we opened up the Shelby White and Leon Levy Information Commons at Brooklyn Public Library, a phenomenal new, new dedicated learning space. Now earlier this year at, at, uh, at DC Public Library, my current employer, we opened up our own digital commons at the Martin Luther King Memorial uh, uh, library, and that was also roughly about $3 million. Both of these spaces represent some of the best examples of purpose-built and site-specific spaces designed for both access and skills development. Um, architecturally, they promote optimism and energy. Um, you're excited to learn there, and that's really, really crucial. How many public library uh, computer labs, when they exist at all, um, exist in a converted basement space or a storage space? You know, who wants to learn in this really imp uh, oppressive environment? Um, you know, how many times do we have to share our spaces with other library activities? Um, so that's, that's a, a, a huge issue. Um, programmatically uh, exciting purpose-built spaces like an information commons provide uh, myriad benefits. First of all, they invite partnerships. Uh, specifically, they invite partnerships with like-missioned organizations that want to uh, leverage the library space and our expanding collection of, of toys to deliver technology training on our behalf. So at DCPL, we work with organizations like Biteback. I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Biteback. They're a not-for-profit that uh, basically provide workforce development and, um, and computer literacy to under, underserved populations. And they work with us to augment the amount of basic computer and workforce development training that we're already offering. Uh, we're also hosting affinity groups in our bi-monthly like, DC tech meetup. And while this meetup doesn't necessarily Im result in direct training to the public, it does sort of expand the library's network. And I think that we're going to uh, find ways to leverage these new relationships down the line. Um, after we opened the Information Commons in Brooklyn, we were able to establish a phenomenal relationship with an organization called Brick Arts Media. And Brick Arts Media is an organization that their goal is to get more people to, uh, to take advantage of their public access, access channels. And in order to do that, they need to train people on how to use media. So their concentration is on not just basic skills, but also um, how to use a, a, a camera, how to do podcasting, how to do all these sorts of things. And they love the space at the library, so they were doing these things for free on our behalf. So it's a really, really terrific partnership that these really wonderful new spaces can, can help um, cement. Um, so putting the partnerships aside momentarily, public libraries need to invest heavily in staff development in order for us to better align our skills with those in demand by our patrons. Um, similarly, we need to revisit our job descriptions and begin hiring folks who understand their role in our institution is primarily to teach as opposed to, um, to do some of the things that, uh, that you know, we kind of think of as, as what it means to work in a library. Other investments need to be made in providing library staff access to both hardware and software applications that people outside the library want to use. Um, old joke, in my old job, we had Windows 95 until like last year. And you know, it was, it's difficult. You know, it's a difficult environment to give people the skills they need when you're using really antiquated software. But you know, you're on a schedule where you, you know, refresh every 20 or 30 years, and it's a problem. Um, uh, you know, we need to make more public training expenses capitally eligible. So right now, PCs are eligible for capital funding, but laptops are not. Uh, we need to continue to look at E-rate reform to direct more funding to public computing and training. Uh, we need to augment our marketing budgets because as much as, we, as much as we do, people are always surprised that the public library is living in this digital arena. Um, so clearly we need our elected officials to give us more financial support. Um, and the last thing I might ask from our elected officials is their trust. And what do I mean by that? I think that there are, and this is speaking from very recent experience at my last job and possibly in my new job, um, there are very powerful and well-intentioned men and women who feel very passionately that libraries should look a certain way and their success should always be measured by the size of the collections on the shelves. Uh, now, we as library administrators, we're proposing changes to that sort of antiquated service model, and we're often met with great resistance by folks whose vision for libraries does not include phrases like digital readiness or information commons. So that's something that doesn't take a lot of money, but does, does help us get our, 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 our jobs done. And with that, I'll, I'll probably leave it.